Welcome to this section, Capacity Management. In this section, we'll take a look at what are resource containers and how do they apply to capacity management, the different consumption models in Visualize Operations Manager, including demand, allocation, consumed, overcommitment and how to apply overcommitment, and then projects as well as pipeline management. In this section, we're going to dive into resource containers and how they apply to capacity management. We'll go into what are resource containers, what is the difference between observed and configured metrics in regards to capacity management? And finally, some policy or best practice recommendations for capacity management in your own environment. One of the first decisions that needs to be made in relation to capacity management is what containers are going to be selected. A resource container is a set of metrics for an object type that gives capacity data for one particular aspect of an object. The resource containers for a resource are usually quite predictable and are defined in the capacity slash time remaining section of the VROPS policy. For this provider, we use metrics that would commonly come from capacity management within that field. In VC, for example, the most common options for containers are objects such as CPU, memory, network, disk IO, disk space, and so on. Although administrators cannot define what metrics are used for resource containers or define their own resource containers, they can select which resource containers are used to determine capacity remaining. There are two important points we need to take out of this. The first is that um, for each object type, different containers will apply. For example, what we're looking at here is a vSphere cluster. We can see, for example, that we have CPU, memory, data store I.O., disk space. We can see on the right which capacity containers are selected. Different objects will have different containers applying to them, even though all objects can have a capacity remaining batch. For example, a data store might only have um, data disk space remaining, data store I.O., etc. The second important point to take into account here is that we should only take into account containers that we want for that particular object based on our capacity management policies. So for example, what we mentioned in the previous chapter is that the capacity remaining batch takes the most constraining resource to determine its score. If you look below, I've got a, 13, a score of 13% for capacity remaining because I have 13% remaining capacity. We can see from the metrics below, this is determined by memory. I've only, it's rounding up roughly 13% of memory available. Now we can see on the right, I can choose which containers I enable and disable to determine that factor. If we expand memory as well, we'll actually see there's different types of memory consumption models, demand, consumed, allocation. We'll dive into that in the next video. It's an important aspect though to consider what containers you might want to enable and disable based on your environment. For example, in this case, I have disk space enabled as a container. Now it's not the most constraining container in my, in my use case with 52% remaining. However, for many customers, LUNs are presented or provisioned as the environment grows on demand. vSphere isn't across this, so it might say if you've got disk space enabled, for example, that that's commonly the most constraining factor. If you're looking at this example, which is a vSphere cluster, commonly the most things that people would be concerned about would be CPU and memory in terms of modeling capacity remaining. vSphere configuration limits are also another common one, and possibly if we have an environment that is maybe constrained by network I.O. or disk I.O., those metrics might also be included as well. Another important factor to consider when choosing a resource container should be where the supporting data comes from and how it originates. In other words, how VROPS calculates that data. With vSphere data, each container's total capacity is either configured or observed. We can see for a CPU example, it states that it's configured, where if we look at data store I.O., it's observed. It would be the same, for example, for network I.O. Configured total capacity is a hard factual piece of data that VROPS has access to or is able to directly derive from other data. But a good example of this would be the cluster CPU or memory information. Through vCenter, VROPS knows exactly how much uh, gigahertz and gigabytes of memory each ESX host has. Therefore, this is quite a factual number and it's quite a, a well-known limit. Conversely, observed total capacity is a value that VROPS has had to estimate based on historical maximums observed. A good example of this would be data store I.O. or network I.O. If we take data store I.O. for example, there is no way for VROPS to know exactly what the maximum I.O. of a data store is when very little is known about the underlying storage. Even if VROPS did have a detailed understanding of the underlying disk pools and RAID groups, for example, there are just too many variables in the equation to give a definitive maximum. This doesn't mean that containers that are using observed metrics should be ignored or not be used at all, but it's something to consider when comparing metrics across different containers. One thing to keep in mind as well, that, you, that configured metrics are generally quite static over time. For example, if we, unless we add or remove a host, it's unlikely these will change. However, observed metrics or observed capacity can change over time. If VROPS, for example, sees a VSphere cluster is able to push more network bandwidth through 
or is able to do more I.O. across all its data stores, the total capacity could increase or decrease over time. Now before we end this video, let's go through some high-level policy recommendations around containers, specifically for vSphere clusters. vSphere clusters are the most common object that people are applying capacity management to in the vSphere world. And what we'll do is a quick high-level overview of some of the recommendations that we generally make around these containers. The first is CPU. If we take the most common constraining factors in a vSphere cluster environment, CPU and memory would be right, be right at the top. Therefore, we recommend that CPU would be an enabled container that you would consider for policy. We'll dive into in the next section the differences between demand, allocation, and consumed. In a similar fashion, memory. Memory is one of the most common constraining factors in capacity management for vSphere clusters, and it's very common that it will be, it will be enabled. Now that we've discussed CPU and memory containers, let's discuss the network I.O. containers. The network I.O. containers are commonly disabled due to some of the drawbacks that we discussed earlier around observed containers. It is also common with network I.O. that other third-party solution packs would be used to look at physical network utilisation. It is also rare that network I.O. is a constraining factor in most environments since the common introduction of 10 gigabit networking. Similar to network I.O., Data store I.O. is commonly disabled due to the constraints of observed containers. However, unlike network I.O., data store I.O. and storage performance in general is a highly important area of capacity management for virtualized environments. As such, it is recommended that an administrator keeps an eye on performance capacity in their storage environment, and this is commonly provided by third-party vendor-provided solution packs. That now leads to the final two areas, vSphere configuration limits and disk space. vSphere configuration limits are commonly left enabled simply because these are configuration limits that are recommended to never be exceeded by VMware, and the limits are generally so high that it's really a constraining factor. That simply leaves disk space. Disk space is a situational capacity container, and should be enabled in some situations and not others. In situations where storage is pre-provisioned, so for example you're either using a vSAN environment, or all the storage from an array has been pre-provisioned to an environment, disk space can be a very powerful factor in determining how much capacity is left in your environment, and allows VROPs to be a single pane of glass for compute, memory, and storage. However, in the case where storage is provisioned on demand, for example, as a vSphere cluster nears its capacity limit in terms of storage, new lines are carved off from the array, it is recommended that this be disabled and this feature be provided by a third-party solution pack. That now brings this section to a close on containers.